Uh, let's open our Bibles up this morning to uh, Genesis chapter 28 and also Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so I want to bring a couple of things out this morning that I want you to think about. Um, <clears throat> Genesis 28, and we're going to read verse 12 and 13, which says, they're talking about Jacob. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it to thy seed. And then verse 16, <clears throat> And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the place, the name of the place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Lux at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God be with me, and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And the stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. We go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> You'll find it shortly. And we read the exact same verse numbers. Uh, it's amazing sometimes how things fit together. It reminds me a lot of Ivy who used to end up giving you a series of scriptures and they all you know, had the same chapter and verse numbers. Well, here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says uh, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the empty thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It is amazing that when you look at these two portions of Scripture, that they are so amazingly similar. Amen. In fact, without uh, the shadow or without the portion we read there in Genesis chapter 28, you would not understand what Paul was saying here in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if we you still got your finger there in Genesis 28, I also want to read out now verse 15. It says, And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places where thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will give it, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. And I thought that was just an amazing uh, promise that God made to Jacob. He said this, I'll say it, he said, and will bring thee again into this land. Now I am absolutely sure that he was not talking about the terra firma that he was standing on. That God would bring Jacob to this place again to take him somewhere. And as we cover this this morning, uh, I hope you begin to see the spiritual truth or the spiritual reality of what was really going on. Amen. 
You know, you will never understand the fullness of Genesis 28. Amen. And you certainly will not understand the fullness of the New Testament without having them both together. In Genesis 28, we see what? We see a ladder. In Genesis 28, uh, we see the angel of God ascending and descending. What's ascending mean, Joel? Going up. We see the angels going up and the angels coming down. In Genesis 28, we see, what else? We see the place. And that place is called the house of God. Uh, it is called the gate of heaven. In the same portion of Scripture, he mentions that stone. And what did he do with that stone? He poured oil upon it. He called it God's house. He called it what else? He called it a pillar. Amen. So we see all that there in Genesis 28. And to most people, it's just a story. And that's all it is because they do not understand the spiritual truth or the spiritual reality that God wants to get, uh, to get from that. And of course, here we have an excellent example of how God wants us to understand, how God wants us to study. God said to truly understand, you need to do it what? Line upon line, precept upon precept, hair a little and there a little. So a bit, of, a bit of the old, a bit of the new. Amen. If you get a bit, of, a bit of the old and a bit of the new together, you'll understand what God is really getting at. Amen. In fact, uh, in Genesis 28 there, we see the fullness of the redemption or the redemptive work of God, or the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We see the work of Christ. But also in Genesis 28, we see something else. If we'll look a little bit deeper, we see the work of the church, or we see the work of the body. We see the work that you and I ought to be involved in. Amen? Also, I've become to realize, if you do not understand the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ, and the Word of God for the most will be a mystery to you. Amen. Remember Hebrews 9 and 28, which says this, So Christ was once offered for the, to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him a second time, what will He do? <clears throat> he comes without sin unto salvation. Amen. The first time He came for what? He came to die for sinners. But the second time He appeared, He came for what? To bring salvation. Amen? And of course, most people put that bringing salvation way out in the future. Amen? Whereas the truth is, He came on the day of Pentecost to bring salvation. Amen? And we need to praise God for that. Amen? Again, see, most people, because they do not put in the effort and they do not allow the Holy Spirit to lead them, most of what is called the Old Testament is just a story. But Bible tells us that the Old Testament is not a story, it is the Scriptures. And the Bible says that, that all Scripture is given by God, amen, or God breathed or by the inspiration of God and it's profitable for what? For a proof, it's profitable for doctrine, it is profitable for Correction is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, uh, we, we were discussing this portion of Scripture and we realized that uh, the reference to this portion in Genesis 28 is what? John 1, verse 51. Let's turn to, one, to John 1, verse 51. And we're just going to spend uh, this Sunday, maybe next Sunday as well, just digging into this and seeing how rich Genesis 28 is, how rich this dream that Jacob had truly is, and how it helps us to understand, amen, the work of Christ and above all the work of the church. So John 1 verse 51 says, he said, Hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending. Amen. Upon, upon the Son of Man. So is that the exact same portion that Jesus was referring to? Was Jesus referring to Genesis 28? Is it not the same picture? In Genesis 28, we see the angels ascending and descending upon a what? Upon a ladder. We see Jesus, we see them ascending and descending upon a ladder. Now what in Genesis, sorry, in John 1 verse 51, who does Jesus say that he is? 
Who does he say that he is? Now, what else does he say? Look at it. What, what does he say that he is? Remember, Jesus is referring to Genesis 28. He's, he's referring to Jacob's dream. Amen. He says he's what? He says, I am the ladder. Amen. So, he's, so right away there, we begin to understand what's going on in Genesis 28. I mean, Jesus is giving us some truth. He's saying that that letter you saw in Genesis 28, that is me. Amen. I am the letter or I am the anti-type to the type or, or of the letter or, or the letter was the shadow, but I am the reality of what Jacob was dreaming. Amen. Now in Genesis 28, what, do we, what happens with this letter? Well, let's look there. What happened in verse 12? In, in, in verse 12 it says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth. Uh, if you look at the literal trans, 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 translation, it says raised up. It means raised up. It was raised up. Amen. So in, in Genesis 28 we see the ladder is set up upon the earth. And of course for it to be set up it would have to come from somewhere. And of course, did Jesus Christ come from somewhere? Well, yes, He did. We go to Hebrews chapter 1 and we look at uh, uh, verse 6 and we discover that Jesus Christ came from somewhere. Amen. See, most of us came from the gleam in our Father's eye. Amen. <coughs> But Jesus Christ came from somewhere else. Uh, I'll find it in a minute. Hebrews 1 verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Amen. He came from, God brought him from somewhere. God brought him from heaven. Amen. Christ is the ladder. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, Scripture always interprets Scripture. Yeah, we need look no further than the Word of God to find the meaning or the understanding of the Word of God. Now also the word ladder has two meanings. And first of all, it comes from the uh, word kalem, which, and that came from the root word uh, kalal which means to raise up. And of course, that's clear, isn't it? When you have a ladder, it's not a ladder. You know, if it's just lying around, well, we call it a ladder, but it's not functioning as a ladder until it is raised up. I mean, what else is a ladder? What is it a type of? Yes, it's a, it steps to somewhere, but what, it's a bridge. I mean, a, a ladder is just a vertical bridge, isn't it? That's what it is. It takes you from one place and take it from one place to an other place. Amen. So in 1 John 50, one, sorry, in John 1 verse 51, what was Jesus Christ saying that he was? He was saying that he is the bridge or he is the ladder. But notice here in Priscilla in, in, in uh, John 1 verse 51, I've got you all over the place. <clears throat> what did he say? <clears throat> he said, hereafter, Hereafter, amen, he said, Hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Amen. So here we have Jesus Christ in the beginning of his three and a half year ministry upon the earth. Had the ladder yet been raised up? Well, no, it had not. He said, Hereafter, after this, amen, he was walking on the earth. Amen. He said, Now after this, Amen. The ladder will be raised up. Amen. Remember that Jesus Christ came to who? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he sent out his disciples two by two, he sent them where? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, what do we read there? In Ephesians chapter 2, we read about two houses. Now, who were we joined to? He's referring to the Gentiles and referring to the people of the Old Covenant. What did he call the people of the Old Covenant? Who, what did Paul call them? He called them saints 
and the household of God. And you and me have been brought into the household of God. We didn't begin the household of God. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for that. Amen. Jacob is of the household of God. Amen. This morning. And praise God for that. Amen. So in, in John 1 verse 51, he said, Hereafter, amen, will the ladder be raised, amen, so that the angels can ascend and descend. Amen. Well, let's see if the ladder was actually raised up hereafter. Amen. So we just want to put everything together. And then we might, once, once we get all the facts together, then we can begin to discern the spiritual truth that God wants us to know. Amen. So we go to John chapter 12. <clears throat> also, I'm kind of helping you a little bit to kind of study and, and, uh, and see how rich and rewarding study can be. Amen. And, 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 and uh, so we go to John 12 and verse 32. It says, it says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Amen. Or maybe again, I think the literal translation talks about being raised up. Amen. So Jesus Christ saying that when I'm raised up as the ladder, I will draw all men unto me. Now, importantly, in Genesis 28, what was at the top of the ladder? What was at the top of the ladder? Who did, who, who did Jacob see at the top of the ladder? Amen. He saw God. God was standing at the top of the ladder. Amen. So Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Amen. If I be lifted up, if I be raised up, I will draw all men unto me. Again, the ladder is just a vertical, vertical bridge. Amen. I will be the bridge. Amen. From the earth to heaven. How was the ladder raised up? Or as Jacob saw, set up on the earth. Well, the next verse tells us, uh, verse 33. It says, uh, <clears throat> when I find it, this said he's signifying what death he should die. Amen. So now we understand that the ladder was raised up or set up on the day of Calvary. Amen. At the death of Jesus Christ, when he was raised up on the cross, at that time, the bridge or the ladder was raised up. Amen. Jesus became at that moment the bridge. There was no bridge until he was raised up. Amen. The Old Testament believers had no bridge. Isn't it interesting again when we go to Genesis 28 verse 15 when God said to Jacob, I will bring you back to this place. Because what did Jacob say that place was? The house of God, the church of God. Amen. The kingdom, the gate to heaven. And he's made Jacob a promise. You need to understand he wasn't referring to Jacob in his physical lifetime. But he's making a promise to Jacob that he was going to bring him back to that place. Amen. He's going to bring him back to the bottom of the ladder that he might ascend into glory and into the presence of of God. Amen. Not in a dream. Amen. But in true reality. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Remember that Jacob saw in his dream, he saw the ladder and he saw the angels ascending and descending. But at the top of the ladder, he saw God. He saw Jehovah. Amen. He saw the Father. Praise God. Amen. So, what is the ladder? What does the letter do for us? It brings us into the true presence and reality of God. If we will ascend the ladder, we come into the presence of God. Amen? If we will go over the bridge, 
Amen. If you'll dare cross the bridge. Amen. If you'll dare walk up that ladder, you'll come into the presence of God. Amen. What did Jesus say in 14 verse 6? John 14 6. I am the way. Amen. I am the way. Come on, climb that ladder. I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father. He's at the top of the ladder. But by me. And, and the thing is actually sick. Can someone look at John 14, 6 for me? Let us say by or through. A lot of times we, inter, we interchange those two things. By, amen, by. Again, giving us that marvellous truth of Genesis 28 and the truth of John 1 verse 51 that we have to come by Him. You have to climb the ladder, amen. You don't go through Him, amen. You go by Him and praise God for that. Look at John chapter 10. Let's put another little, uh, little fact together. We're getting all these facts together. Amen. I hope you are enjoying some of this and it's just about to get a whole lot better. John 10 verse 7. <coughs> then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but to kill, uh, cometh not but to steal to, uh, and to kill and to destroy, but I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now again, what do we have reference to? We have reference to Calvary. Amen. Reference to Jesus Christ giving his life. But what else do we discover more importantly? He said here, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out. Notice again. And when, when we climb the ladder, what are we going into? Into the presence of God. Amen. We've got it. We go in. And here again, the order is what? We go in and out. In. Amen. And when I am the door. So again, it's a reference to Genesis 28. It's a reference to John 1, John 1 verse 51. Amen. And tells us what about the angels of God? We discover here in, in uh, John chapter 10 that the angels of God are all the believers. Everybody who's in Christ, everybody who ascends the ladder has to be an angel. Amen? And of course, that's contrary to belief amongst many today who think that the angels in the right hand of God are specific people or ministers, amen, or clergy. But that's not what Jesus Christ taught. Jesus taught that every single believer, amen, has to ascend the ladder, amen, or does ascend the ladder. And they are therefore all angels. If you're a believer this morning, you are an angel of God. Amen. So that ties in with Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. When we begin to identify the officers within the church. Amen. Of apostle, prophet, uh, pastor, teacher, evangelist. And, and they are for the work of what? For the perfecting of the saints and for the work of ministry. We all are in the work of ministry. Amen. And God has uh, set aside or ordained uh, certain within the body of Christ who help you in your ministry. Amen. We can't be born again unless we have a message. Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. Amen. Uh, I suppose if we are born again, this is a better way of putting it. If we are born again, we bear a message. And therefore we are ministers. We are angels. Amen. Uh, that's what an angel is. An a angel is just somebody who has a message. You are messengers. Amen. You have a story to tell. You have a good story to tell. Amen. Of how you were taken out. Amen. Of sin, sorrow and defeat. Amen. And brought into freedom, 
victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And we need to praise God for that. Amen? So all the saved go in and go out. We're not going, and I think the out is going out with a message. Amen? We go up and we come down again. Amen? Amen? Because we have a message to give. Amen? Therefore, I believe with all my heart this morning that the angel of God, that everyone who's born again this morning is in the right hand of God. Amen? We're in the power of God this morning. And praise God for that. Amen? Praise God for that this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, according to Genesis 28, where is the presence of God? <clears throat> where is the presence of God? The house of God. You know, uh, you'd expect to find God in this house. You know, we're, talking about, you know, we're not trying to be super spooky. You know, uh, where do I expect to find Sarah? In her house. In the house of Sarah. Or the house of her husband. Amen. Well, that's where I expect to find God. In the house of God. Amen. Now, is that true? Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and, and look at verse 19. It says, and what is, I don't know, what, verse 19, here we go. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 1 Timothy 3 and 15. Somebody go to Psalm 48 for me. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And notice there we've got a pillar again. Where did... Where did Paul get this idea of pillar from? Did he just kind of dream it up one day? That's, that sounds like a good thing to say. The church is a pillar. No, he got it from Genesis 28. Amen. He got it by direct revelation from God. Amen. He actually read the dream of Jacob. Amen. And actually believed what is written there. That the church is the pillar. Amen? That's what he identified the church to be. He's got Psalm 48, verses 1 to 3. Amen? Where is God's house? What is God's house? Zion. Zion is the house of God. Look at John 14. You see, what Jacob was dreaming was more than just a story. Amen. It, it, it is about the complete work of Christ and the work of the church. John 14, he said, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's... Why do we have to believe in Jesus Christ? Because He's the ladder. He's the ladder. And I'll explain that some more in a moment. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Where are we going? To the Father's house. Where did you go when you were born again? To the Father's house, you join the household of God. And what is the household of God according to Paul? It is the church of the living God. Amen? So what did Jesus Christ do when He died on Calvary, when He raised the ladder? What's the first thing He did? He went to prepare a place for you and for me. In fact, he went to prepare a place for two groups of people. Amen. 
the dead in Christ and the living in Christ. And you, some of you might click to this and some of you may not, but I want you to think about this very clearly for our uh, Wednesday night. When we're talking about the dead in Christ, amen? Jesus Christ, when He died at Calvary, died for two groups of people, amen? One are the dead in Christ and the other were the living in Christ, amen? The dead in Christ were the people of the old covenant who had passed away. Jacob was dead in Christ. Abraham was dead in Christ. The brothers and sisters in Hebrews chapter 11 were dead in Christ. What do they have? Faith in God. They had faith in God. I mean, what does Hebrews 11, uh, 11 uh, uh, verse 6 say? But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a, re a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Who? God. Who do we seek? God. You know, you read the Scriptures, who, 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 who do we have to do with? God. Amen. Who, who do we pray to? God. Always God. Pray unto God. Seek God. Amen. Seek the Father. Amen. Who did Jesus tell us? How did He teach us to pray? Our Father which is in heaven. God. Amen. Jesus Christ died for two groups of people. The people of the Old Covenant, according to Ephesians chapter 2, who were the saints of God, of the house of God, and us, the people of the New Covenant, the living, amen, who were brought into the house of God. Amen. Let's look again, look at the house of God. Uh, we read Psalm 48. Look at um, uh, Psalm 132. I'm uh, just trying to put all these together for you. Just put them out there. I want you to think about these things. Amen. And then we're going to, amen, some today and some next. We're going to sort of narrow it up a little bit. <clears throat> you know, because there's so much false doctrine out there. And it can be so quickly cleaned up if we understood the comings of Christ. If we understood what Jacob was dreaming, if we could understand the promise that God made to Jacob that he would bring him again to that place. Amen? And not talking about coming to the same spot of dirt. Amen? But Jacob needed to come to that place when the ladder was raised up. There was some time after Jesus Christ came from glory. Hallelujah. Can you just imagine for a moment, amen, what happened in the spiritual on the day of Calvary and how there was movement in the spiritual, amen, and, and how things were, were taking place, amen, and, and how that without seeing there was a ladder raised up, a bridge raised up, and how without seeing, amen, souls began to ascend, and we couldn't see it, but yet it was taking place after Calvary. And I believe on the day of Pentecost. Oh, amen. Praise God. Let's see it. Uh, <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. Oh, when the saints go marching in. And they did, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Can you imagine, you know, uh, Jacob and Abraham and David, amen, and, and, and the other saints there in Hebrews chapter 11, when they came into the real and true presence of God. Hallelujah. I wonder how many up there right now, amen, said, want to shake us and say, come on. Amen. You are in the presence of God. You ought to re be rejoicing. You ought to be glad. Amen. You have ascended the ladder. Amen. You are with the Father. And we capture that reality through these Old Testament pictures. Amen. They help to shake us, 
to jog us, to stir us. Amen. To keep the world and, 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 and our flesh at bay. That we might enjoy the fullness of the kingdom of God today. We were talking this morning in our forum about, about partaking of the real and true promises that God has for us. I mean, that will not serve us after we're dead. Amen. I God meant them to serve us today. Amen. I and you can just reel them off. Amen. I Healing for our bodies. We won't need that when we're dead. Amen. I we need Christ the healer today. Amen. Uh, you won't need to be worried uh, you know, about work and all those things when you're dead. But you need God to provide for you today. Amen. Wonderful promises. And of course, they are only minute things. Amen. But when it comes to wellness and peace of mind and, 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 and those things that God wants to have, a joy that cannot be put out, that God wants us to enjoy now, you'll have no trouble enjoying those things when you're dead. Amen. But God wants you by faith, not blind faith. Faith is reality. Again, Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I mean, this is not a blind thing. This is about he's as real as Sarah is now. Here, now. That's what he wants us to know. Amen. What does verse 1 say of Hebrews chapter 11? Now faith, now faith, now faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But it's so hard for us from time to time. And that's why we need these Old Testament pictures to help us to realize and to build our faith. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that was the Old Testament. That's the Scriptures. That's where we get this faith that we need. You know, a lot of folk today, I mean, they say, well, you just read the New Testament. No, you've got to read the Old Testament. That's where our faith is built up. That's where we begin to see the pictures of what God has done for us. Amen. It is through that that we can imagine what took place after Calvary as the ladder was raised up. Amen. And the saints of God began to ascend. The angels of God began to ascend into glory. And then we begin to realize that we didn't have to wait. The moment we were born again, we ascended into glory. Into the house of God. Amen. We we're going to Psalm 132, I said, wasn't it? Uh, verse 11. The Lord have sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it, of the fruit of the body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, then I shall teach them. Their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Verse 13, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. Hallelujah. Praise God. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. And you know what? We need to be using Hebrews chapter 12 much, 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 much. Amen. Because if we can just pull down some of these false doctrines, have the courage to pull them down, we'll see people set free. Amen. They'll see that there's a ladder they can ascend now. Amen. They'll begin to see that Christ has come and that He set up the ladder unto salvation. God is salvation. The church is salvation. We'll get on about the church. Where am I going again? Hebrews. It's always good to read Hebrews. Hebrews 12 and, and of course verse 22. We just read there in the Psalms about Zion. Amen, about the throne of God and God's habitation. It says, verse 22, But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the house of God. The city is the house of God. And the heavenly Jerusalem 
I mean, Revelations 21, is it? The new Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Clear, clear as day. Clear as day that Zion is the church of God. Amen. That Zion, that Mount Zion is the church of the firstborn, the church of Christ. What's, what's Christ's second name? What's his surname? God. What's God's first name? What's God's first name? Trick question for you. No, he's not Roman Catholic. So I wasn't allowed to say that. What, what is God's first name? Yes, yeah, Jehovah is Lord. Jehovah is just the word Lord. Amen. God's first name is Lord or Jehovah. Jehovah God. Amen. That's the Father's name. But Jesus' name is Christ. Jesus God. Amen. Jesus God. Amen. We got theirs. That's just. <laughs> Verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that sprinkled better things than that of Abel. What was the first act of Calvary? What was the first act? Think about what is the first thing the blood of Christ did. Amen. It raised the ladder, obviously. Amen. What did, where did it raise the ladder to? Yeah, so where to? Yeah, where to? Zion. Amen. The ladder was raised. Where is God? God is in his house. This is called Mount Zion. Amen. The new Jerusalem. Amen. So the very first thing that the cross did or Calvary did, it raised a ladder or a bridge to Zion, the house of God. For what purpose? So that angels could ascend. Which angels? Which angels? The angels that died physically pre-Calvary. Surely. Amen. Those from Adam to John the Baptist. That they could ascend. You know, as again, the promise that God made to Jacob. He said, I will bring you again to this place. Why? So that he could ascend the ladder as one of the angels of God. Does that make sense to you? Remember here in, in verse, in, in verse uh, 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 23 there, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Amen. These were the people of, uh, that were represented by Hebrews chapter 11. Old Testament believers, those who were dead in Christ. Amen. So the first act of Calvary was a mediation or a reconciliation between the people of the Old Covenant who were the house of God. Read that in Ephesians chapter 2. They were saints because they believed in God. Amen. And of course, the living in Christ they were reconciled into one body. Remember in Ephesians chapter, chapter 5, it says, says that he gave himself for the church. He gave himself for the church. Again, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm saying this for a very, very important reason. We read it before, we shall just quickly read it again. 
11. It says, Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that, that, at that time you were without Christ. Of course, he's, de- he's, he's dealing with, with pre and post Calvary. He's dealing with the people or pre and post covenants. The people of the old covenant, the people of the new covenant, amen? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Amen. God brought the people of the old covenant and the people of the new covenant together into one house. Amen. Into praise God for that. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. We could go there for a while. For to make in himself of twain, one new man, so making peace from two distinct and different groups of people who had faith and have faith in God, the people of the old covenant, the people of the new covenant, he made one new man. There's only one city. There's only one new, there's only one church, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Uh, Verse 16, that he might reconcile both. See, the first act was reconciliation, that he might reconcile both, both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached, preached, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them which were nigh. Of course, again, he's talking about the natural Israelites and us who become spiritual. Israelites. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> verse 18, for through him we both have access, we both have access, both, by one spirit unto the Father. Amen. How is that possible? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Amen. What is the baptism that is with the Holy Ghost? Born again. You must be born again. Amen. How's it done through the baptism? Uh, What number am I up to now? 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. He's talking about, we we were the strangers and the foreigners. Now God didn't start something new at Pentecost. He just made a way for you and me to partake of. Amen. Amen. To join. Hallelujah. Amen. He had a house. Amen. Or he, or he had prepared a house. I mean, of course, he couldn't get those Old Testament saints in the house until the ladder was raised up, or they were certainly the first to enter the house in reality. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. We are not the first saints. God had a whole bunch of saints. Amen. The dead in Christ. The people of the old covenant. They were the saints of God, the angels of God. And when Christ died, he raised a bridge that they may be the first to ascend into the house. And, and verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. And uh, we could read on and on and on there. Amen. But, but, I, but I don't want to. I want you to understand this importantly. What does false religion teach you about natural Israel? That they will be saved. That they will ascend the ladder at a future date. That God will do something special for them and accept them outside of Jesus Christ to the kingdom. Amen. But there is no way into the kingdom or into the house 
S out of the letter. You've got to come by Jesus Christ. And what do we read here? What does Paul say? When did that take place? Right at the very beginning, the first to enter the house, the true house of God, into the very presence of God, were the people of the old covenant, the dead in Christ. Amen. They had their day. They're not waiting for a day. Amen. You see, false religion teaches a reconciliation during or after some tribulation or some millennium or some rapture. But Paul preached and believed in a reconciliation that took place now 2,000 years ago. Amen. When God brought Jacob back to the place. Amen. And this time it wasn't a ladder in his dreams. It was now a ladder in his reality. And as an angel of the Almighty God, he ascended into glory. And thank God we read there in Ephesians chapter 2, amen, that we're not looking for a second coming of Jesus Christ to ascend ourselves. Amen, but that ladder has been raised up to glory for 2,000 years and every soul that is born again who gives their heart to Jesus Christ in sincerity and in genuineness ascends the, amen, into the throne of God as an angel of God. Amen, and God wants us to know that and God wants us to know the reality of that. Amen, that we keep what we have. Amen, that, 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 that we stop trying to believe, that we stop trying to imagine, that we stop trying to have faith. Amen, that through the pictures of the Old Testament uh, shadows and types, we can see what we actually have. Amen, as real as we are here today, that we don't have to imagine, that we don't have to try and stretch or reach out. Amen, that we don't have to conjure up faith. I mean that we can believe and believe as reality that we are in the house of God. That we can believe that we're ascended up into glory. That we need not be afraid of backsliding. That we not be afraid of what the world can toss, and toss at us. Amen. We need not be afraid what the physical throws at us. Because we have joined Jacob. We have climbed the ladder to glory. Amen. We are seated in the heavenly place. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, amen, where we are raised up together in Christ. And we can preach again on in Christ for another half hour or so, but study that in Christ is in his body. And you can study that and find that his body is the church of God. Amen. I don't have time right now, but I just want to share with you and tell you something that Jacob's letter was more than just, amen, Jesus Christ. Amen. But right there and then, and of course you see in the latter part of what Jacob says, he was also talking about the church. And the church had a vital part to play in his dream. Amen. And of course, Paul brings that out again himself. Amen. When he calls the house of God, the church of God, the pillar of truth. Amen. People think that they can have Jesus Christ outside of the church. Amen. Or they can ignore the church or not be in awe and reverence of the church. But again, God wants us to know that we must be in awe and in reverence of our mother. Amen. Who brought us forth. Jerusalem from above, whom is the mother of us all. Amen. And uh, yeah, I don't have time to, to explain that right now, but we're going to do it. Amen. You know, uh, when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, what was his last words? He says, it is, what is finished? What is finished? Amen, it was the conclusion of the plan and the work of God. Amen, when he brought the old saints in. Amen, the dead in Christ were raised up. Amen, and the living, and the living in Christ were raised up to sit together in the heavenly place. Amen. And I don't know how that fits in with, amen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but it fits in somehow. It fits in somehow, my brothers and sisters. Amen. But I want to tell you right now, uh, amen, you're sitting as close to Jacob uh, as you'll ever sit. 
Amen. In the throne of God. Read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We sit in the throne of God tonight. Oh, sorry, this morning. Hallelujah. I feel like I'm preaching tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're sitting as near to Abraham. Amen. This morning as you're going to sit to Abraham. If you'll believe it. Amen. If you'll sit with him. Amen. For they have ascended and are the angels of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God would permit me to preach once saved, always saved. If you climb that ladder, stay in the presence of God, you're a shoe in. Amen? No devil can kick you out. No trouble can shake your being. Amen? Paul could not be shaken. He didn't care what was thrown up at him because he understood Genesis 28. He knew what Jacob had dreamt. If we'd only know what Jacob dreamt, the house of God, God is in his house this morning. Amen. People ask, where's God? Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? Is he in the trees? Is he in the leaves? Where is he? Where is he? He's everywhere. No, he's not everywhere. You're not everywhere. Why would God be everywhere? And he's in his house. God's at home. Amen. <clears throat> So where's the best place to find him? <laughs> In his church. Amen. Next week we'll discover that the church today is the bridge. Why do I say that? Why can I say that? Yes, he's in the, why, why is, give me scripture to tell me that he's in the church. Are you in the church? Uh, what's in you? Christ in me. That's what Paul said. Christ in me. Amen. Wherever Christ is, there's the ladder. There's the bridge. You know, it's very sad when you think about it, how uh, we, even ourselves, and many are still doing it, uh, are, are trying to cut out 90% of the body out of their active role in the kingdom of God. Amen. If you are born again, if you are a believer, Jesus said that you go in and go out. Amen. You are an angel of God. When you really think about it, it's, it's, it's quite silly when you really think about it that God just has a few people in his right hand and the rest are... Now I go to the Old Testament and find that if you're born again, he has engraven your name on his... Amen. Can you imagine what kind of father we'd have who just... Uh, of all his children, amen, but he only, you know, as he crossed the road, he, he only took three or four of his favorites and said, you rest, just do whatever you like. Just, just I hope you get across. <laughs> amen. <laughs> just go for it. Just see how you go. No. God takes us all by his mighty hand, by his right hand of power. Just because uh, the letters were sent to the angel of the church doesn't necessarily in itself say there were not other angels. Amen. And if it was sent to the pastor of the church or just the angel or an angel. Amen. 
That's the way I see it anyway, my brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. I want you to see this morning that God's plan of salvation is mighty. It is wonderful. It's powerful. It's powerful. Amen. God wants us to see, and I'll say in our mind's eye, in our spiritual eye, that what happened at Calvary was more than just a man being lifted up. God wants us to see, amen, that if we could see, we would have seen a move in the spiritual realm. I think in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about Jesus Christ taking captivity captive and ascending. And ascending. Who did he take? Jacob, <laughs> and Isaac, <laughs> amen. So he took, took them, they were captive and ascended to glory with them. God didn't start with us, he started with them. Sometimes people think, you now those old covenant people are second rate. Now they're first rate. Be glad that we were grafted in. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes we act like, sometimes we act like they're just in and we're the. Uh -uh. Amen. We are grafted in. Hallelujah. Next week we shall continue and maybe make it a bit clearer. It's, it's amazing the ministries, the ministries that are out there who are all trying to help Israel, natural Israel. Amen. Uh, you know, helping them to get to, helping Israelites to get to natural Israel. And then writing books about what's going to happen to them in the future. The book has already been written. <laughs> and Isaac and Jacob are already re rejoicing in the throne of God. The moment the ladder went up, up they went. <laughs> Amen. Up they went. If only mankind today would have that same, there's a ladder, let's go. <laughs> Amen, praise the Lord.